the preservation of and increased access to the 92nd Street Y Humanities Audio Archives is generously funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Enabling me, sax is glasses and beard. Incidentally, the man from California who phoned me has an enormous uh, and sometimes comic internal inventory of characteristics like this, certain salient characteristics for identifying faces or places which do not present themselves as real to him but as schematics. Um, now, um, one can, to some extent, find an, one can find a nice objective correlate to this by photographing the movement of the eyes as they look, say, at a face. Now, here, um, uh, you see uh, these are normal eye movements as a face is being scanned. You see how rich they are, and um, they concentrate on the eyes and the mouth, but everything is taken in. This is a comprehending sort of gaze. Um, and one, someone face, and one would experience it intuitively as normal. But this was not the sort of way in which, in which a prosopagnosic, someone who can't recognize faces, gazes at one. If we can look at the next slide, please. Um, you see here how lost the person is. Um, uh, these are almost random movements. Nothing very salient stands out. Movements like this can't, don't even give the formal prerequisite for making sense of a face or a place or a scene. Um, and there has to be an intellectual insistence on looking at particular things, glasses and, or beard or, 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 or a an ear, or a mole, or a dimple, or something like this. Um, now, if you want to know, we, uh, we've said that um, it's very important and fascinating to have um, depictions from the inside. One wonders, how do things look for someone like this? You've seen those beautiful pictures of um, of mosaic faces. Now, I very much regret that I, um, I hoped I might have them, but in fact, I cannot show you some of the pictures which Dr. P painted. He was also a gifted painter, because uh, in a very fascinating way, one sees a movement from richly concrete, naturalistic paintings to rather abstract, schematized, diagrammatic paintings. This might be seen as an artistic change, but it might also be seen as a pathological change, and most interestingly of all, it might be seen as both. So that as the sense of con concreteness and particularity disappears, so the sense of abstractness and boundary and contour and contrast might be emphasized. And so an agnosia like this might uh, tend to move one to abstract painting if one is a painter. This is a point I'm going to come back to in detail uh, later with regard to a totally colorblind painter whom I've been recently seeing. Now, if you ask someone with a visual agnosia to draw something, they will draw it perfectly well. But they don't know what they're drawing. A film which hasn't been shown here, but has been shown in the BBC in England, um, shows such a patient uh, presented with a, um, with a cotton reel. I'm afraid I, I sometimes don't know which is the English or the, or the American expression, but um, uh, you know what a cotton reel is. A spool, there you are. Uh, um, now, um, he, he can give a very good formal description of a spool in terms of a cylinder with, with, with enlarged ends, but he can't identify one. Um, however, if one is put in front of him, he will draw it so exactly that anyone else can identify it, except he himself doesn't know what he's drawn, because he is not forming an image. Incidentally, 
this not forming an image n is not only the case in perception, but in imagination as well, and in memory. Images are expunged from the imagination and the memory in visual agnosia, and even from dreams. Uh, vis visual images disappear. Um, now, this agnosic patient could draw this figure perfectly well from life. When he was asked to draw it from memory, he drew that, um, which, is, which is sort of nothing. Uh, let's have another slide, please. Uh, can we have the next slide? Um, this, um, I alas don't have really time to talk about uh, this much, but um, all parts, I, I said earlier, that all parts of the brain are involved in, um, in seeing pictures. Now, this is something at a higher level, and at one, what one might call partly a personal level, or certainly at the level of attention. Uh, the visual, the agnosia, is the level of computation. Um, here is a picture. I'm afraid it's, it's almost indecipherable in the original, and more so here, uh, being looked at by a normal person. And the salient features are picked out by eye movements. You see sense being made of the picture. You could almost guess what the picture was from this. If someone has their frontal lobes damaged, uh, then, although their perceptual mechanisms are intact, um, their attentional mechanisms are not. And they can't alight on salient things and examine them, uh, but there's a tendency to, to make inert movements or perseverative movements uh, which have the same effect, finally, of preventing something being taken in. There's a little uh, story, a very short one, in the hat book called Yes, Father, Sister, about a patient, a very intelligent woman, who has a frontal lobe tumor. Um, at various times, she calls me uh, father, sister, and doctor. And I said, well, what am I? And she says, first, she says she sees my uh, white coat. And uh, let me, no, I, what's the, I've got it slightly wrong. Um, no, uh, I think uh, she sees my beard, and this reminds her of a Greek Orthodox priest. So she calls me father. Um, then the white coat I wear reminds her of the white garb of the sisters in The Little Sisters of the Poor, and then she calls me sister, and then she sees a stethoscope, and then she calls me doctor. And I say, you know, but don't you see them all at once? And she says, no. Now, this is the sort of thing you're seeing here. People get hung up on a single feature, and then instead of seeing the whole rich picture, uh, instead of seeing me as a, um, uh, uh, as what I am, you know, uh, I get decomposed, or the picture gets decomposed into items like this, which are then taken to stand for the whole. If we can look at the fourth slide here, um, I've forgotten exactly what this is about, but this um, uh, this shows some. Th I think this is to show recovery. Um, something like a house. Well, a formal picture of a house can be done even if there's quite a lot of brain damage. The house improves, but not that much. The very striking thing is that the United States, which has a rather complex physiognomy, is hardly imaginable or memorable at all to someone here with this brain damage and, uh, and surgery, and then something like two weeks after surgery, you have a very reasonable map, much more reasonable actually than I can do myself in so-called health. <laughs> okay, um, can we have the lights again, please? Um, 
Now, I've almost finished my introduction. Um, no, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to run, I'm sorry, I'm going to run through some other slides more quickly. Um, on second thoughts, can I have the next slide, please? Now, I don't know whether, um, if you gaze at this, especially if we dim the lights, um, if you gaze at it, uh, you will see, it will seem to be in constant motion, and you will see patterns forming and unforming and changing. Now, of course, um, this, the patterns are not in reality. That's still there. You are constructing all these changing patterns. This will show you the activity of your own brain and your own perceptual processes and how, the, and how construction is continually going on at every level from this very elementary pattern-making level to, if we can have the next slide, uh, the most complex feature extraction. Uh, now, a great deal has been done very recently on how much recognition or delineation can be done by computers. Uh, an extraordinary genius in this was a man called David Marr, who died as a very young man from leukemia, and when he knew his death sentence, wrote a book on vision, trying to compress a lifetime's thoughts into what time he had left. Um, this is an illustration from David Marr's book on vision. Now, um, what you see on the right could be extracted by a computer, by artificial intelligence. And you see how much can be done even without a person being there. And um, so I think I've sort of in a way, come to the end of what I might call the first half, or the bottom-up or computational processes which occur in the neural construction of reality, and particularly a visual reality. You can get what David Marr calls a primal sketch, or a raw sketch, with a good deal of detail of all sorts, um, not merely features like this, uh, but color, luminosity, movement, and everything else. Um, now, um, in the way of pictures, and um, uh, I wasn't going to show any slides. I was, in fact, only persuaded about 20 minutes before we started. I don't know whether it was a good idea or not, but anyhow, I, I seem to be doing so. Um, let us assume that a complete picture has been formed one way or another. Uh, let's look at the next slide, if we may. Sorry, the next slide. Um, now, this is from, uh, I wish I could have uh, had a whole chapter on Parkinsonism and art. In Parkinsonism, uh, things, especially abstract forms or things which are done fairly automatically, like a signature, may shrink down and they may be done very small and very rapidly. And there's a sort of dynamic pressure which crushes them. This is a sort of crushed, crushed clock. Um, one has the feeling that there's been psych psychologically a sort of Lorentz contraction. This. Uh, and to some extent, I think some of these Parkinsonian things uh, can almost be put in relativistic terms. Now, interestingly, it is only rather abstract things like this which get subject to Parkinsonian pressure. People with severe Parkinsonism can do beautiful paintings or make music which does not get crushed in this sort of way. Art gives back time and space uh, and perspective and spaciousness and freedom and rightness as it should be. Uh, you see this in every sphere. Uh, the Parkinsonian who either freezes or has a little stuttering walk may be able to dance beautifully. Music organizes him in time. And 
the visual world or art will organize him in space. So there are Parkinsonians who on a featureless uh, sidewalk will only have these funny little steps, but who can walk perfectly in a complex terrain full of rocks and shrubs and trees and mosses. This, um, this compression is overcome by art. Incidentally, to take an etymology which may be false, but I like to believe in, the opposite of art, I was told, was inert, and that inert originally used to be in art. And in general, the inertia and the passivity of various pathological conditions is overcome by art. Um, now, talking about art, let me show the last slides, and then the slides will be over, and the lecture will begin. Um, can we look at the next slide, please? Um, you may recognize this uh, from Hat. Um, uh, this, um, uh, this was a retarded and autistic youngster who was unable to speak or perhaps to understand language um, because he also had a lot of damage to the auditory lobes, uh, the hearing parts of the brain. But he was a beautiful drawer. And, uh, and, he, didn't, um, and he would sometimes look at the original and then sometimes turn away and do something which is at once a copy, but also more interesting than the original. The original looks eh, it's a little stuffed. Uh, uh, it's not really alive. It looks a bit like a stuffed trout, a stuffed fish. Whereas Jose's fish has, has this wonderful maw this, um, and it has this sort of crocodilian snout. And it also, I think, has certain human attributes. It, uh, when I saw it, I was reminded of the frog footman in Alice. Um, so here we're at the point where this is not merely a p um, in, the, in the autistic. Uh, there's a certain tendency to have extraordinary perceptual fidelity. And you see that here. But over on top of the perceptual fidelity is the personal. There's character, there's humor, there's personality, there's the person there. Um, so here again, um, somewhere behind the circuitry and the software and the automatisms, which are necessary for perceptual correctness, on top of that, and utilizing that, the personality starts to come in. So that Jose has not just drawn a fish, or the fish he was supposed to, he's made it his own fish. And it has a richly subjective quality, which is all his own. And we are now, of course, passing in from the objective computational to the subjective and the personal. I wonder if we can look at one more picture. The next slide, please. Now here, even with something which makes no sense to Jose, or for that matter, probably to most of you, unless any of you are, are histologists, uh, I don't know whether you can read this. This is a 250 times magnification of some cells, a ciliated epithelium from the trachea of a kitten, as is probably you recognize. Um, <laughs> Uh, but of course, Jose, being retarded, did not recognize it <laughs> as... <laughs> um, now, but when I gave it to him, what he did, on the one hand, would sort of almost grace a, uh, a histology textbook. It's a, and, but on the other hand, it has a sort of um, fun and liveliness and humor, which, um, which, you, which is, is, is almost one better than the reality. <laughs> a again, he's added his own subjectivity to this facsimile. Can we have the lights again? Um, I, I mentioned a bit earlier, and I now wanted to describe to you, and I will show you the final slides. I've recently been seeing an artist, a very gifted painter, 
Is this still working? Yeah. A very gifted painter who, because of a cerebral accident, suddenly and totally lost all color vision. So that, um, uh, now you think of color blindness sometimes as perhaps a confusion of red and green, which you may be born with. And this indeed is the common form of color blindness. But there could also be a sort of color blindness, which is because something has happened to the brain. The eyes are perfectly okay, but the association areas of the visual brain can be involved. And then you may have partial or complete and gradual or sudden uh, color blindness. And with this artist, who was a very gifted colorist, whose whole world and medium had been color, it was a peculiar cruelty of nature that the very thing, which was his world and his medium, was taken away from him. And uh, he describes this rather frighteningly. He was, um, there'd been the accident the previous day. And then uh, the next morning, uh, there was a violent headache and, and other indications of, of a cerebral shake-up. The next morning, as he was driving to his studio, everything seemed misty and grayish and indistinct. He was stopped by the police, who said, you've been through three red lights. Do you realize this? And he said, no, he was sorry he didn't. They wondered if he was drunk, but he wasn't, though they thought he looked a bit ill. And he got to his studio, which was full of, br was full of brilliantly colored abstracts, uh, and, and all the color had gone. Uh, and to use a phrase which he was later to use, he found, he th found himself in a world which was as if molded in lead, and sort of gray and black. Um, here, where the internal generation of color has gone, not only can color not be seen, but it can't be imagined. Just as Dr. P can not only has lost the perception of form, he has also lost the imagination and the memory of form. So this artist, although he has a tremendous formal knowledge of color, and can tell you the color, say, of the billiard table in Van Gogh's painting, um, and match it. Uh, he used to, at one time, for matching, use a thing called the Pantone chart of several hundred different hues. He can tell you uh, that the billiard table was uh, a green 540K, or whatever the, the hue was called, but in his mind's eye, he can't see it. Red looks black to him. Not only does a tomato look black, but if he closes his eyes, in his mind's eye, it still looks black. Uh, he would often dream in color, dreams in black and white. He would sometimes have migraines in color. That's one of the beauties of migraines, uh, that these scintillating things have brilliant spectral colors, even his migraines in black and white. Now, I, um, this was very catastrophic for him because color had been felt as, th as the reality bearer. Um, but I will say he is making, as, as so many patients show, and although I seem always to be talking about disorders, what I want to, what I'm really interested in is survival and adaptation, and especially creative adaptations, so that when one thing goes out, other things are used and may become much stronger, and reality and life can be recreated in other terms. With this man now, um, he has become a very powerful black and white artist. Um, uh, other artists like Klein and Rothko have, have turned, turned to black and white for artistic reasons. This is a man who turned to black and white through dire, sudden physiological necessity. Um, and he has, in fact, I think, become, in a way, more richly sensitive to nuances of, uh, of form and depth and edge and movement. Some of the things which, in a way, were, were less attended to because color was preeminent for him are now more attended to. Finally, I just want to show you some slides uh, from his work and also some artifacts he has made. If we can have the next slide. Um, this was um, one of his paintings before anything happened. If we can, um, I will say that he had a great many styles. He was 
very an exceedingly versatile uh, artist who would do abstracts or realistic paintings, portraits, whatever. If we could look at the next slide. Um, when this happened, he at first refused to accede to the fact and said, I shall paint in color. I will somehow do so. Um, he painted a, um, I, I deeply regret here that I, I have a slide missing which is sort of needed. Um, he decided to paint some roses. What came out were these sort of polychromatic messes. If you take a black and white, um, but he said they were fine. If you take a black and white picture of this, or if you look at them through the black and white finder of a video camera, you see the exquisite tonal delineation of the roses. However, you can't see that. The normally sighted can't see it through the color. The color camouflages the tonal composition. Um, so anyhow, his friends, when he started producing the, these, his friends said, his fellow artists, they said, you can't do it. This may be fine for you, but it doesn't make any sense to the rest of us. Forget color. You know, to be told to forget color. Anyhow, the next slide, please. Uh, this was his first black and white painting. Um, it is actually full of, of, of uh, haunted, blinded, shadowed, averted faces, sometimes bits of body. I mentioned a Luria book called The Man with a Shattered World. Somehow I think there's something about this kaleidoscopic, boxed-in, framed, shattered quality. This is, this is a man whose visual world and also whose sense of visual reality had, had been somewhat shattered. But being an artist, he could articulate his predicament and his agony. Um, let's look at, um, I forget what the other slides are, but let's look at them. Um, oh yeah, um, uh, um, here's a boat drawn by someone with severe red-green color blindness. You know, we can't enter other people's experience. Those who are color blind don't know can't communicate what it's like, nor can we communicate to them uh, what our state is like. Um, uh, this, incidentally, uh, I was just reading an interesting paper by a, a colorblind analyst of five colorblind analyzans whom he had seen over the past 30 years. And, um, it's, um, and in each case, peculiar disagreements. Um, the son of a friend of mine at the age of three, when they were driving to Maine, said, look at the beautiful orange grass. And they said, that's not orange, sunny. It's, it's green, you know, an orange is orange, li like an orange. And he said, yes, it looks like an orange. I mean, he might have been five, but um, fortunately he was the son of, of an intelligent ophthalmologist um, who, um, <laughs> you know, who didn't beat him and tell him he, he was lying or mistaken. Um, but um, uh, the world is given, the, vi the visual world and the chromatic world is, is given or rather constructed differently by the colorblind. Uh, and uh, if we look at the next slide, this is, uh, this is his black and white boat. Uh, this. Um, artist makes a point of saying that actually no mechanical analogy like saying he's he used to be distressed because people would say eh, color blindness big deal he said it is a big deal or they would say so what I, I i like black and white photographs or films or my black and white television and he'd say there's all the difference when it's not just an image you can look away from but it's all around you and 360 degrees and 3D and there all the while, and it's not an image, it's a world, a world, as he put it, molded in, as if molded in lead. At one point, to illustrate this, he made what he called a, uh, a gray universe, which was a set, uh, an, a cubicle in his studio uh, where the, walls and the drapes and, the, and a table and chairs and an entire banquet, an entire dinner was set out 
um, all in various rather hideous shades of grey. And he insisted, if you went into this, that you have the uh, exposed parts of your own flesh painted with what he called flesh shade. And there was a mirror there so that you could see yourself. Um, uh, a few little artifacts from this grey universe have remained. And in these last two pictures, let me show them to you. Next slide. Um, this is one of his, his grey pears. It's, uh, how would you like to eat a pear like that? Um, and finally, uh, the next slide. Um, here is a real orange. Uh, there is one of his oranges. There's a lovely red apple, which, uh, and the way it looks for him. And um, incidentally, when I showed him this picture, he hesitated somewhat. He didn't immediately see which was the real fruit amid the artificial fruit. Um, these, incidentally, were models he made himself very, very rapidly. Um, he has done his utmost to communicate what it's like. Let's stop the slides and turn on the lights and pull up the screens and let me say my final 4,000 words. <laughs> um, I do seem to have run over time a bit. Um, uh, I, um, uh, um, well, um, you see what has to be done by the nervous system uh, visually in terms of providing form and motion and color and angles and lines and time in extracting features and making patterns. Uh, these are all computer-like things, but they have to occur so that you, as a living person or a living animal, can use it and make a real scene or a real face. Um, can this conceivably be done by a machine or by artificial intelligence? Now, interestingly, we say with Dr. P, who had this peculiar difficulty recognizing faces, he had no difficulty playing a game of mental chess. As you know, computers can function at the chess master level. And another, another two or three years, they'll be functioning at the grandmaster level. And then, as it were, <laughs> there'll be no point playing chess, of course, except there is. But the chess playing part of us can be matched by a machine. On the other hand, machines have the greatest difficulty recognizing faces. And when they try to do so, they do so rather like Dr. P. They settle on certain formal characteristics of shape and delineation, and they can't go beyond that. Now, everything I've talked about in this neural construction or the, or the neural prerequisites, this is simply the starting point of being alive and being an animal and being human and the domains of the aesthetic and the spiritual and the mystical and everything else. Um, I, th there, I've been called a materialist, I've been called an idealist, I've been called a dualist, I've been called, I wouldn't like to tell you the things I've been called. Um, I, um, I sometimes give talks with irritating titles like, like Neurology and the Soul. Um, I was due to give such a talk in London, but I, I had just met two very eminent colleagues uh, with, who, though themselves intensely alive and living contradictions to their own theories, <laughs> had such powerful theories of man as a machine, of the brain as a computer, of, uh, of, of mind as simply being a federation of modules, that I... Um, uh, that I found it difficult that, that I got battered down by them and lost my feeling of the acting and existing person. Now, I do believe uh, uh, that behind all the circuits and the automatic processes and the computations, there is a person. And... Uh, and... Um, which I suspect may forever defeat 
any schematic uh, models or analogies. Um, the person in this way seems to me to be like art, which also has this, this transcendent quality. I think that all of these things have to be composed, and then over and above this, there is a sort of magical act of creative or personal synthesis which makes an image which is living and alive and yours. At the moment, physiology and psychology can hardly touch that. Uh, but it seems to me that one of the exciting and proper projects for the future is the sort of physiology and neurology and psychology which will begin to delineate what it might be like to be a person, to see a scene, to put meaning into things, and to be alive. And, um, and here we are only at the beginning, but here I have to be at my end. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid my watch stopped again. Um, listen, I, uh, Thank you very much. I have uh, many questions and I will try to group them in categories so that we don't overlap too much. Uh, but here's a question that somebody asked that I was tempted to ask myself. Can I have your word processor since you're not using it? Um, m maybe. <laughs> but but I, I, yes, I, I'm very tempted to, to, to give it away, at times to throw it away, but um, possibly. There's several questions that are related, and they refer to the soul. Um, you mentioned the soul twice, but did not elaborate on your ideas. Where and is there a place for the soul in neurology? Um, well, I was saying right at the end that I think there is. I don't think there's a... Um, um, I've never been able to comprehend, let alone subscribe to any, as it were, notions of, of a disembodied soul. Um, but... Um, after one has looked at all the integrative processes in the nervous system, I think the final integration is a personal integration. And, um, uh, and I think uh, another way of putting this is that one has to look neurologically as well at what it means to be a particular person. Um, uh, you know, um, it would be, for example, particularly exciting if one could do so undestructively to look at the neurology and the, de uh, the neurological development, say, of a Mozart. And um, unfortunately, people don't come along complaining of being a person or a genius. They only come along complaining of, of, of disorder or disease or suffering or sometimes of being an unperson, though that's usually mentioned by other people. But, but, but I, think, uh, I think a neurology of the soul or, or to put it less um, ethereally, of being a person is, is, uh, is, is the project which, uh, which may make the 21st century worthwhile if we haven't, um, if we survive till then. From a neurological viewpoint, what is a thought and what is an emotion? Um, uh, Jonathan Miller has a nice phrase when he talks about the expressions on the face of the nervous system. Um, I somehow think of, of, of thoughts as, as like that, as um, uh, uh, thoughts obvious, uh, obviously represent uh, integrations of vast bodies of, of experience and uh, uh, and knowledge and conception and sometimes feeling as well. Um, I don't think we'll ever be able to read people's thoughts, but I've no doubt that the brain is in a different state with each thought. But I would think that, th that the brain state can only be deciphered by that brain. Uh, 
I think one might be able to do a sort of crude. Uh, if one does with a thing called a PET scan, a, a form of brain imaging, um, you can see the parts of the brain which are active. If you ask people to look at something or to imagine something, you see the visual parts of the brain active. You can tell when they're thinking visually or if they're thinking or if they're internally reciting a poem. Or, But um, I don't know. That's another question for the future. Um, uh, um, feeling is obviously a much more elemental thing and um, I would imagine, in some sense, that the primordium of feeling uh, is to be found in, in, in every animal. Th there's a wonderful image by Sherrington, the physiologist, of looking down the microscope at a, at a flea and then seeing things magnified. He feels the flea is living in an absolute ocean of affect. But I think affect or feeling... Uh, is one of the things which is in life almost from the start. Um, but, uh, but I can't say more now. The fact that most of our brains are given over to the visual, is this an over-dependence on our par part or the way we were meant to be? God knows, or maybe he doesn't. <laughs> My tunnel vision, or as this person writes, hardening of the categories, be neurologically based? And if not, what? Uh, wait, um, he's using tunnel vision as, as a metaphor. I believe so. Yeah. Um, well, um, I would think um, both ways. Um, in Goethe's last letter, he has a lovely sentence, uh, something like this, I, I can never quote exactly, um, at least when I'm speaking. He says something like, the ancients tell us that we animals are taught by their organs. I would say yes, and we teach our organs in return. So, to some extent, we are determined by our brains, but then we determine our brains that everything is at the intersection of biology and biography. Uh, and um, specifically, our brains may dispose us to either spaciousness or closeness, but then we may, we may dispose our brains to either openness. Um, this is one of the reasons I'm against astrology and, um, for example, and, uh, and other things which are so fatalistic because these seem to deny the possibilities of altering anything in life. Does a person with a highly developed corpus callosum have a better adjustment to left or right brain strokes, in the visual, at least? Um, I ought to know, but I'm afraid I don't. Next question. What sort of danger, and that's in quotation marks, does a clinician face in treating an artist the possibility of disrupting a subjective reality? Possibility of? Disrupting subjective oh, um, reality. Uh, well, I think um, the, the respect, I think the first rule of, of the medicine, of a proper medicine, and one which isn't reduced to CAT scans and high tech, is listening to the patient and attention and caring and the sense of his individual existence and not imposing either descriptive or prescriptive grids of one's own over this. I think this becomes especially uh, the case if one is dealing with, uh, 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 with an artist. And um, I, I by no means, um, for some reason, I find myself thinking that uh, Rilke once went to Freud um, saying he had a few problems, <laughs> and um, but uh, Freud decided with great delicacy that um, not only could he live with his problems, but they might be indispensable to his art, and uh, uh, therefore did not barge in analytically. However, um, in general, I often feel that a sensitive analysis, neurological or psychological, not only leaves the person intact and undestroyed, but may increase their sense of their own richness and subjectivity.
as with the woman frozen in the bath, are the patients always immobilized when this occurs, or are they moving about as well? And if the person is not immobilized, how close is this to a blackout? How frozen would this woman have been had it been fire instead of water? Um, well, when perceptual arrest occurs, the person is always motorically frozen. Um, when I first saw these post-encephalitics, I saw these extraordinary frozen beings who had, in a sense, in whom the flow of being had stopped uh, or tended to stop. Um, as for fire, um, all sorts of emergencies um, may, in fact, suddenly um, break up this motionlessness and there, there are countless cases of sort of Parkinsonians leaping out of their wheelchairs uh, uh, on, on Miami Beach to save children from drowning, uh, for example, um, you know, and, and things like this. But sometimes it doesn't work. Now, um, what Lola would have felt if the water had gone above her armpits up to her nostrils, I, I don't know. But, um, yes. These are related questions. Um, who are your neurologist heroes? And you mentioned Luria and referred to British literature, and this person would like to know who else in this country is concerned with perception and the mind. Um, well, my, uh, the only one of my heroes whom I, whom I had personal contact with was, uh, was, was Luria. Um, Who's, um, who's wonderful, wonderfully productive and, and in various life uh, spanned most of the century. Um, in particular, Luria wrote and said he felt impelled to write two sorts of books, which he calls classical and romantic. The classical books have titles like Higher Cortical Functions and Man and Neurolinguistics. Uh, the romantic books are wonderful descriptions of a life like the man with a shattered world and the mind of an eminist of a life which has been dominated by a neurological disorder of one sort and another. In the case of the mind of an eminist, by a neurological gift. Um, incidentally, I don't know whether any of you have read a recently published novel called Perfume, uh, which is about a Mozart of a nose, uh, a sort of olfactory... Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.